So, Pyari Mohan Prabhu and Brahmadirta Prabhu, please welcome to the Monks podcast. Uh, thank you very much for sparing your time. And Brahmadirta Prabhu, you have been here before. We had a discussion on intellectual outreach. And you know, you are, I, <clears throat> you, have, you, have found, you have been one of the managers of VAST. You have been you know, known very well as the perfect questions answerer or asker for Tushila Prabhupada. And uh, we'll come back to you, Pyari Mohan Prabhu. You know, well, I'm very proud to be seen as an intellectual. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm surprised. I was also very proud to be that, seen with intellectuals. Hmm? Yes, yes. <laughs> but you have created a forum of intellectuals also. So yeah. it's wonderful. So Pyari Mohan Prabhu, you know, I, I got to meet you when I came to Connecticut. Uh, you, you have been the longest serving president in our movement in Connecticut. You, you really connected with Krishna and connected with the devotees in Connecticut over there. So I remember, uh, so today we are going to discuss the topic of humor in Krishna consciousness. And while I had seen it on many occasions, but probably with you, I saw it in the most provocative and uh, most unforgettable way. I remember after a class, I asked you, what did you like about my class? You, you told it the class was wonderful. So then I asked you, what did you like about the class? So you said, everything except what you spoke. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, 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 I second that. <laughs> so, so I have observed this, that both of you are hilarious and Brahmadirita Prabhu, you encourage me to try to bring some humor into my classes. You know, for quite a few years, I had put as a sticky note on my computer, one of the thoughts which you had given me, that what is the use of a great class if nobody is awake? <laughs> <laughs> So, there are devotees who have told me that when I give classes, one devotee told me after a class that your class is like a one hour intellectual workout. <laughs> so, I have been trying to do that, but I tend to go toward gravity. And uh, I have seen that both of you are able to be both deeply Krishna conscious, at the same time be both naturally and spontaneously humorous. So... I thought we could discuss on this topic today and thank you very much for joining. So I would like to start with uh, maybe you can, whoever among you would like to speak first. I, that we, did, were you naturally humorous? Was that a part of your genes or your family or was it something you consciously learned? Would you like to start? Um, Piari, would you like to go? Well, I mean, my family, my father was not very humorous, but my mother was very funny. Uh, I grew up in New York City in Brooklyn where everything was, uh, you know, like everybody just joked around. I mean, it was, that was the, the whole atmosphere. Uh, wasn't, it wasn't very serious or it wasn't very intellectual. But uh, I, I mean, I don't know. That's what I could think of, like maybe from my, my mother, she was funny. Oh, interesting. And, and also, in, in, in it's, it's Italian neighborhood, and the Italians always joke around. I just had this Italian man, he built a gate for our altar, and uh, I owed him $8,000, $8,000 more. And uh, so I called him up after he was finished. I said, how much, how much do I owe you? I said, no, I didn't say how much do I owe you. I said, I, how much? Yeah, I did say, how much do I owe you? Two thousand, and he said, no, seven hundred ninety-five dollars, and because he he also grew up in New York, so he was also joking. Anyway, I cracked up laughing because I expected him to say two thousand. No, you owe eight thousand, but he he went the, the other way with it and went even lower, jokingly, of course. So I think it's just the uh, when you grow up has a lot to do with it. I don't know. I can't say. I don't remember when I was a baby, if I was funny, I doubt it. <laughs> okay, as a baby. So you... Well, uh, yeah, please, Ramadita Prabhu. 
Okay. Well, I started at a young age. Um, when my uncle came to the nursery after I was born and looked in the window at the babies, and uh, my father pointed out, oh, that's my new son. And my uncle said, that can't be. <laughs> in other words, you wouldn't want that one. And, and so it all began there. And a lot of humor is self-deprecating. And I come from uh, a, a Jewish family. And uh, due to various historical reasons, the Jews have become the expert at self-deprecating humor. <laughs> um, and, and, and so I, I, I kind of brought up with that. With that. And um, as a devotee, um, um, I find the self-deprecating humor uh, really takes the edge out. For example, one of my services is Iskan Resolve, or another service is the Bhaktivedanta Institute. In Iskan Resolve, people are very emotionally charged. So if I can introduce humor at the right point, it takes it down. If I introduce it at the wrong point, it gets people angry. In the BI, I'm dealing with intellectuals, people with brahminical service, so um, everyone wants their space, and it's um, not always possible. So uh, I, I have to spice things up with humor to get people kind of relaxed. So I was kind of brought up my whole life with kind of a little bit of humor. And I also grew up uh, with a disability, and uh, that made me really appreciate self-deprecating humor. Because what am I going to do about it? So I have to... Uh, if I just make a little fun of myself, it takes the edge off. And uh, uh, there's a lot of different kinds of humor. Uh, uh, um, uh, there's just, um, a minute. just one minute, if, you, if I may interrupt yeah. you. Sorry, before yeah. you go into the types of humor, it's a couple of okay. points. Uh, when you said that, uh, say, because the, of various historical reasons and because of your personal, uh, say, yeah. disability or whatever, so is it means, did you consciously notice that you're humorous and you try to develop the humor? Or was it something which just people told you and you realize, oh, I'm humorous? Was it like that? I'm, I'm more, like, more like the latter. The secret of good humor is one thing. One thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to tell anybody because then people won't think I'm funny anymore. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> but there is one secret. Okay, I'll share the secret, but everyone has to cover their ears for this one. Uh, the secret of good humor is timing. Mm -hmm. It's all in the timing. And some, like, for example, I can tell a joke and people will just be laughing and somebody else will tell the joke and people are saying, uh, what's the punchline? Because it has to do with timing. And this is something that comes more by nature than nurture. You can learn it. And you can improve it, but um, a lot of it is nature. You have to have the nature for, for timing. And if one has that nature, they can cultivate that and improve that skill a lot. Uh, one who talks about that a lot is one of the most famous American comedians is Jerry Seinfeld. And mm -hmm. he says, you know, it, it, it's in timing. And then Prabhupada gave his own definition of humor. Would you like to hear that? That's interesting. I know. Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, this is from Shama Sundar's book, Chasing the Rhino. Hmm. So Shama Sundar asked Prabhupada, so what is laughter? And Prabhupada said, it's the difference between what you expect and what really happens. That's beautiful. Well then, Prabhupada, why do you always make me laugh? And then Prabhupada answers, very self-deprecating, perhaps you expect too much from me. So it's very funny. So, okay. you know, the difference between what you expect and what really happens. And Prabhupada, you always make me laugh. And Prabhupada, very self-deprecating. Well, maybe you're expecting too much from me. And therefore, what I say is different than you expect. So humor has a lot to do with cognitive dissonance. I'll give an example. Yeah. I, was at, I was at a wedding one time. Just one minute. You know, I also read one definition of humor. It's quite yeah. similar. It said that it's a sudden resolution of cognitive incongruity. A little more of cognitive yeah. incongruity. It's a little more hybrid definition. But what Prabhupada said, what you expect and what you get. It's a very simple it's and like, way of putting that. Yeah. It, 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 
When I mediate, one of my goals of mediation is, is um, to introduce cognitive dissonance. Because when people are uh, uh, in a conflict, the amygdala in the brain is all lit up, and MRIs prove this. That's where all the blood flow is. So people are thinking with their emotions, but I want them to think cognitively in, 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 in a uh, solution-focused way. So I have to get the blood in the cerebral cortex. So one of the things I'll do, I have to do it very carefully, is I'll introduce cognitive dissonance. And um, we find this in the Bible, where King Solomon says, arguing over whose child is it? Okay, we'll cut the child in half. And it actually, that doesn't fire up the amygdala. It fires up the frontal cortex and people start thinking, and they come up with their own solutions. So if I'm mediating and people are arguing over something, I often, if I think I can get away with it, say something absolutely absurd. Then both sides, opposing sides, all of a sudden are acting together saying, that's crazy. Now they're acting in unison and they're thinking. And so Prabhupada would often use uh, uh, cognitive dissonance. For example, um, Prabhupada um, uh, was asked one time, um, why do you shave your head by a lady reporter? And Prabhupada's answer was just brilliant. Why do you shave your legs? <laughs> okay, it's completely unexpected. Completely unexpected. What can they say? And then Prabhupada goes, better, better have warm legs and cool brain. You know, I have heard this, but I never thought of it in this context. That this is... Yeah. This is this is not just brilliance, but it actually, it is actually conveying, uh, in one sense, you know, it's, it's like a frivolous question. Why make it, take it so seriously? It does a lot of things in one go while bringing some humor into it. Yeah, that's true. So thank you, Prabhu. Pyari Prabhu, so was it sometime at a particular time you realized that you had this capacity for humor or it is just... You just grew up with it because you said it was in the environment. And you also learned to be a, like a magician. So was it that magician and com being, doing, being a comedian, both of them you developed consciously together or it just happened naturally? Uh, I certainly didn't plan anything. Uh, that's not really my style. And uh, even like in this interview, I didn't plan anything. <laughs> So, because it's like, I don't know how do you explain humor. Uh, with Brahma Tirtha is able to explain it in a very scientific way. So I can say, I, I have no idea when I noticed I was funny. I, I really don't remember. Uh, uh, and what was the other part of your question? That's interesting. You know, because I grew up in an environment where I don't know when or how, but being humorous was equated be with being frivolous. And yeah. I used to think that we should be serious about our life. And so I don't really even remember uh, if I, when I used to watch movies, like cracking up with laughter while watching movies or anytime consciously appreciating comedy. And uh, it's not in India also, there are good comedians. But when I was introduced to Krishna consciousness, it was all uh, it's a serious philosophy. You know, we are going in the cycle of birth and death and death can come at any moment. So that only reinforced my seriousness further. And when I met devotees who used to crack a lot of jokes, I had a lot of difficulty appreciating them. I said, Krishna conscious, serious business. How can you be so frivolous? But it is only when I associate with some devotees for a long time, then I, associate, then I realized that actually, you know, being humorous and being frivolous are two different things. So one can be serious about one's spiritual life and still be actively humorous. So when you were introduced to Krishna consciousness, did you notice, was, was were you naturally able to adopt your humor in Krishna consciousness? Or oh, I, I, there was some time of some kind of collision between the Krishna well, consciousness I, philosophy and humor? Came. When I first uh, moved into the temple, uh, and even before I moved into the temple, when I went to the temple every day and did service, 
I was very serious. I didn't, uh, I didn't joke around. I was thinking, you know, I had this idea of spiritual life is very serious and no joking. And uh, I guess after I was a brahmacharya and went on traveling Sankatan, I started to loosen up a little and my, my true nature came out for myself. But at the beginning, I, was, I don't remember joking at all about anything. There was no, no so, joking. Interesting. So, Brahmadir, the was so, also, uh, Sorry, please, you can com you're complete some. You're complete yeah. sorry, uh, I was um, um, artificially serious, which created extreme mental constipation. <laughs> constipation. <laughs> Oh God! Yeah, yeah. It, it, so it it it, it uh, uh, took a little while to get mental relief that way, and I realized that humor fits in. And one thing I realized is Prabhupada was so much funnier than most of us thought, because um, Prabhupada talks about in the preface to every Bhagavatam, he talks about the verse though imperfectly composed, uh, honest men will accept what he says, and in the purport, Prabhupada says, "I'm speaking." in a foreign language. Therefore, there'll be imperfections. When Prabhupada's saying that, he's not talking about his English because his vocabulary is more expansive than mine. Rather, he's talking about the cultural differences. And one of those is some of the jokes he would say, when I listen to Prabhupada, now I see it went over our head. I'll tell you one, one funny one. When my wife first met Prabhupada, um, after I got back from India, now I had lived in India, I was a teacher in the village. So the uh, Indian accent when speaking English in no way was an issue for me. I could understand virtually everything. But Prabhupada had his Bengali accent. And when my wife first met Prabhupada, uh, she was asking a question. And then Prabhupada started answering. And she had that look in her face. Prabhupada understood. She couldn't understand. So he turns to me. It's very funny what he said. And he goes, of course, he was speaking English. And he turn, turns to me and goes, translate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. That's brilliant. Translate. <laughs> that's, that's really funny. And, and, and the way Prabhupada said it, too. And Prabhupada often had that sparkle in his eyes. And I'm just guessing. I mean, I no way I can know, but I'm guessing it was frustrating for Prabhupada that we couldn't get his jokes because he joked around a lot. And, and sometimes when he joked around, um, uh, when he did joke around, he would um, uh, wonder why you know, we didn't understand it. And, and I saw when Prabhupada with his god brothers, they'd be laughing hysterically, just joking at the kind of things we would joke. There's one story I love that Prabhupada told. Uh, one time he was with some of his senior men, including from sannyasis, and he comments, and he says, so I understand the best prostitutes are in Thailand. What do you think? And these devotees, they're mortified. And, and, so now, and I, what, 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 how would I know? And then Prabhupada says, you might know something about this. And they're horribly embarrassed because some of them really do know. And, and they just don't know what to say. Finally, one of them blurts out, said, Prabhupada, how do you know that? <laughs> and, and Prabhupada says, well, when I used to sit in the barber shop way back, this is what people would talk about. And he would hear it. So Prabhupada would come up with these incongruous statements. Um, there was um, one story I, I, I like that. Um, Prabhupada often told us to avoid cinema visits. And so a bunch of devotees were on the airplane with Prabhupada. And they were, didn't want to be in Maya. They have their hands in, in, in their bead bag. And the big screen is on the plane. This before they had individual places and the devotees are holding their eyes chanting Adi Krishna Adi Krishna Adi Krishna you know to avoid watching a cinema and Prabhupada's watching the cinema laughing hysterically and was Charlie Chaplin who Prabhupada had seen in 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 in, in the 30s and, and so finally they asked Prabhupada um Prabhupada was Charlie Chaplin Krishna conscious because Prabhupada's laughing so hard he's watching it and Prabhupada said, no, 
He was not a devotee, but he did understand the essence of illusion and put it nicely in the form of humor. That's interesting. So, so Prabhupada would, la would, like, would laugh at these things. Prabhupada also said something like, you know, Charlie Chaplin is manifesting Krishna's sense of humor. I think Prabhupada quoted something in the 10th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita where everything attractive manifests a spark of Krishna's splendor. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, look at Krishna's friend. Uh, um, just having me a brain blown from him. Yes, yes. Who is always making Krishna laugh. So um, um, just laughing, laughing at ourselves, laughing at the material world in a way that's not cruel. Hmm. For, for example, there can be racial jokes that are very cruel. Yeah. And there can be eth ethnic talking that is very funny. Jews are particularly good about self-deprecating ethnic humor. And I make jokes, well, like I was at an Indian wedding and there were 1,500 people there because the wedding was being put on by um, the president of the Indian Hotel Owners of America, which means, and I looked at the wedding list, uh, of the 1,500 people there, 1,498 were named Patel. And it was at a big convention center. And I'm like the family priest. So I was invited to, you know, give some blessings for the bride and groom. So I get up on the stage and I want to get everyone's attention because, you know, at Indian weddings, no one pays attention. I'm supposed to say something important. So I begin with very seriously, everyone, I've been given this important announcement. I'm looking at a pretend piece of paper in my hand. Everyone, please listen. It's a very, very important announcement I have to make. So I get a little attention and I go, Mr. Patel, you left your car lights on. And. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. <laughs> and everybody's a Patel. <laughs> everyone's a Patel. So then I got their attention. So we can use humor to get people's attention, to get them to listen. And that's what Prabhupada did, though sometimes the humor would just uh, 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 go over our heads. Yeah. By the way, so you recommended that we have this podcast to three of us. So did you, when, when you and Pari Prabhu met, did you first bond because of the mutual humor? Pari Prabhu, how, was, how did that happen? Do you remember by any chance? Well, I remember I was a brahmachari in Houston. And he was a householder, and he'd come, and we in the evening we uh, after the Sunday program. You remember, Brahma Theater? What did we do after the Sunday program? And everybody left. Remind me. We we put up a, a net in a, I think on a third or fourth floor in a big room, and we played volleyball. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we had all kinds of good times. And then, uh, you know, we, we, just have to, we used to have in the Houston Temple. We were near the old Rosalie Street Temple. Yes. Uh, it was in a, an unusual neighborhood. And we'd have a lot of kind of street bums would come because they get a free meal. And then we had a lot of respectable Indians. This was the first temple in which the... Um, Indian community started coming in mass to the temple. And, and so we had to pack them in the temple room. These people were really quite smelly. So I, when they would come, I'd say, well, well we have a ritual. Okay. Uh, we, we'd call them the stinky. So I, I said, we have a ritual you, you must do before you go in. And they said, okay, whatever. So I said, stand like this and turn around. And then I'd spray them with a can of Lysol from head to toe. Oh, God. <laughs> Disinfected spray. And then there were two shoe racks, one in front of the temple and one across the street by the park. So I tell them that to put their shoes over there. And it was, I mean, the devotees found this hysterical. And the smellies didn't know what was going on, and they were fine. So everyone wins. Devotees got to laugh, and the smellies got to go in the temple, and nobody. And then uh, I did a mystical thing in the temple. When I first was offering RT. So, I mean, what was the humor here? So disinfectant put some, took away their smelliness. Yes. They went away and they came back. So that disinfectant smell also went away by that time. Uh, no, no, but they had the disinfectant smell, which was a lot better than their armpit smell. Um, <laughs> okay. But then why ask them to put the shoes away? Or that is just a second rule. That's not relevant. No, no. And then we had them put the shoes across the street because their shoes were so smelly. 
Oh, okay. Uh, that 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 it would make the whole entrance way the temple uh, uh, smell like a, a septic tank. So I, I mean, to the devotees, this was very funny. To the people coming, they didn't care, and to me, it made everything smell better. So good humor, everyone wins. No one gets hurt. If somebody gets hurt in the humor, other than ourselves, and that's usually not good humor. That can be, for example. Uh, sarcasm can be very biting, but it might not be very good humor. And Prabhupada said this at one point where Prabhupada was um, 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 uh, there was a a radio show host who was a real nasty guy, very nasty guy. Joe Pine was his name. Piari might remember him. And he was famous, infamous for being sarcastic and really getting underneath um, uh, his guest skin. And Prabhupada was advised, don't appear on that show. But Prabhupada said, no, I get to talk about the holy name. And so um, it, um, at one point he said, uh, according to your cosmology, you say the world is flat. And now, uh, what they were talking about is in the Bhagavatam, the uh, plane of the ecliptic is all flat. Mm. And Prabhupada said many times the earth is a globe, but many devotees with flat head thinks the earth is flat. <laughs> oh. With a flat head or a fat head? A, a, a flat, flat head. A fat, a, not fat, flat. They have a flat head, I think. No, but um, fat, fat head is uh, also a word, no? Fat head is also full. Exactly. Fat head means somebody full of themselves. So he said, you say the world is flat. And Prabhupada replied, instead of getting into it, he said, everywhere I walk it is. <laughs> and simply, and, 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 then, um, and, and then Prabhupada said, uh, the, the host asked, what would happen if everyone in the world became Krishna conscious? Meaning, you know, who would do the economic development? Who would do these things? And Prabhupada said, don't worry. There will always be fools like you who don't. <laughs> Then, on the way back, uh, uh, and, and after that, the guy was so shut down, and this guy never was shut down, that he let Prabhupada speak for 10 minutes uninterrupted. Because Prabhupada could speak very biting, very funny. In this case, this was a loud mouth, so he had to put him down. But Prabhupada said on the way back to the temple, to the devotees, I can speak like this, but you cannot it is a special dispensation for old men and little children. They can go anywhere and say anything. So we have to be cautious uh, uh, to use a humor that's appropriate for the circumstances, but does not, uh, 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 we can't imitate Prabhupada. Yeah. Well, we're old men now. <laughs> so you have a license. Well, You know, till now our discussion has been hilarious. So let us make it a little more serious now. <laughs> okay. Oh, no way. <laughs> okay. It ain't gonna work. <laughs> no, no, my saying is, is all seriousness aside. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So I will ask you a, yeah. I'll ask you a serious question about humor now. So we'll have humor. Okay. So no, I, I envision this like a circle. But the circle is the message of Krishna consciousness that we want to share with others. Hmm? Now, some humor can act, it's like at the center of that message. And it just conveys that message more forcefully. Hmm? Some humor is at the periphery of the message. But it softens so that the message can be received. Hmm? And some humor is outside the periphery entirely. So where that humor it, in no way aids the message. And at the end of the talk, all that people remember is the joke. And they don't remember any of the message at all. So I put it as, so humor that enhances the message Humor that softens the message and humor that distracts from the message. 
so now i have seen there are some devotees who who are very good at humor but i have talked with them personally also that they, when they give a class and at the end of the class they ask devotees what did you like devotees come and say you like that is wonderful class and uh, yeah what did you like and they said the jokes were wonderful now for a speaker also who is able to share krishna conscious wisdom uh, this is this is disappointing so uh, what do you think about these three categories and what caution needs to be taken for this purpose when sharing humor any thoughts on this Tari Pro, you like to start? Or, uh, or Brahmadi? Or well, or if, me. Uh, if afterwards someone came up to me and told me the jokes, uh, I I would be encouraged. Really? <laughs> But then, are your jokes always Krishna conscious? Uh, can you give an example? I hope not. Can you give an I example of a joke that if people remembered, you would feel encouraged? Some have you had any recent experience like that? And that would I don't I don't have people talk and I don't talk to people how my class was afterwards I just uh just finish and and it's over and go on with the next thing you know I just try my best and that's it but I do I do remember once actually where I I gave a class in Russia at a festival they said like 7000 devotees went to this festival And I didn't want to give class because I'm not one to really, you know, be enthusiastic about giving classes. But uh, is its name Chaitanya? Uh, there's a sannyasi. Chaitanya, Chaitanya, Chaitanya Ch- Ch- Charan Chandra or something, na? No? I'm not positive. He's from England, I think. Okay. Anyway, he was there. And, he he said something that really encouraged me so i decided i'll give a class so then when i read the verse and stuff i thought of a magic trick that would really fit very well it's about how you're not the body uh you know we have different there's, there's so many designations it was about designations so i had a uh, i had three ropes all different sizes and i i i gave the class and at the end of the class i just wanted to 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 use some physical things to help help people to remember you know this and this these things because sometimes when you're giving class if you have like either a slide show or you have something else besides just speaking it it registers more so i have these three ropes and i explain that this the designation some people are rich and i show the long rope some people are poor I show the, the short rope and and most of us are like you know average income some people are beautiful i show the, the long rope some people are not very attractive i show the short rope and most of us are just average looking some people are, are men some people are women and then i have another rope and i say some people are whatever uh and uh <laughs> took you a while to get that one <laughs> and any anyway so i say but actually with none of these and i put the three ropes in my hand and i i just got to bring them up and and then they all become the same length so actually we're all 1/10000 the tip of the hair in size and i take the one rope two ropes three ropes and show that they're all the same so then people are amazed and then and then i put put the ropes where anyway there's the six tops because there's three ropes and then i say and i put them up in my hand and i say but actually some of us in the spiritual world are gopis and i take out the long rope some of us are parents i take out the medium rope and some of us are coward boys and i take out the the sh- small rope so they're all different sizes then i also throw the ropes out into the audience because i knew they're going to think they're trick ropes and they're not trick ropes it's like real magic uh but what i realized after that is nobody remembered anything from my class all they thought about was the magic trick i just did so that was a kind of like uh really took away from whatever it was even though what i said during the magic trick was krishna conscious uh but uh i i just think afterwards like it really didn't help at all the class it just took away from it but so that's an instance of but most of the time it does keep people awake you say something funny in class people 
you know, become more sharp and listening more, mm -hmm. uh, especially when everyone laughs and they and the person wasn't listening, and then they want to know what do you say? What do you say? <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> you know, I was just thinking about these three categories. Just to continue this, you remember? Uh, you, you, I think in a class of Rampad Maharaj in Chicago, he asked about oh, de demon. No, no, no. in Can Houston. That was no Dallas. It was in Dallas. Dallas. Okay, it was Dallas. a temple presidents meeting. That was really nice. It was a yeah. temple presidents meeting, and Ramapada Swami gave class. And then after class, someone asked a question that wasn't even related to the class. But they asked, "Why is it when Lord Ramachandra came that the first demon he killed was a woman? And why is it?" When Krishna came, the first demon he killed was the woman. Why is that? So Ramapada Swami, I, there's all temple presidents there, so many people he could pick, sannyasis there, GBCs. And he said, Yari, do you know? And I said, ladies first. And then everybody cracked up, and that was the end of the class. <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> so this, you could, this type of, this is, Brahmatitabu, this is similar to what Prabhupada did when he said, better to have, say, cool, cool heads than cold legs. So this is like a, almost like a, either you can call it softens, it softens the Krishna conscious message, or you could say it even dodges the issue. And sometimes dodging the issue is what is best required in that forum. If you don't want to get into technicalities. So, so you, you have any thoughts on humor and conveying a Krishna conscious message? the category that I talked about on that or any, any related thing? Sure. Um, uh, a few different thoughts. One, sometimes I'm asked a very surcharged political questions. Well, do you think we ought to do this or we ought to do that? And, and I realize I don't want to get into it. Uh, um, so it might be some political issue with ISKCON. It could be o o over types of initiation or some surcharge issue. So they'll ask me in the either or question. And of course, you know the obvious answer. It's yes. <laughs> what do you mean? And that diffuses. Somebody will say, well, do, do you think we should do it this way or that way? At the end of a class, some political question that may I don't want to get involved with. So they'll ask you either or question. So I simply answer yes, which is a non-answer to the question. And then there, everyone starts chuckling and then I go on to the next question. Because I want, I, I, I want to avoid it. Um, they, they teach in minute. martial arts that judo is more effective than karate. Because in judo, you use the weight of the person coming after you to knock them down. In karate, you have to use your own strength. So at times like this, we can use humor as judo. Oh, okay. So turn it around. Uh, to, yeah, to answer the second part, um, too much humor. I mean, I, I could do a stand-up comedian routine. People will remember that class as one of their favorite classes, but they're not going to learn anything. Uh, I could also give a very boring philosophical class, and they'll learn even less. So it's a matter of proper balance, because the purpose of the humor is not to make people think I'm funny. It's to make them interested. I mean, Prabhupada, for example, would often tell Gopal Bond stories. Mm. At one time, I, the, my favorite one here, everyone knows this one, where one day the king says, Gopal, what's the difference between you and an ass? And he immediately measures the distance from the king. And he says, sir, it is three feet. The difference is three feet. <laughs> so yeah. Prabhupada would tell these stories like this, the Gopal Bhatt stories, because even a king and even Krishna liked a court gesture, someone that can make them laugh, but it has to be done in the proper ways. I was giving a very heavy class in Vrindavan, one that had a lot of reaction after the class. And the topic was loneliness um, as devotees. Because as devotees, we get a lot of cookie cutter. We have to look like this, talk like this, walk like this. And people's individuality gets suppressed. And in the beginning, that's necessary to break us out of the bodily concept. 
But as time goes on, it becomes um, quite a burden. And so it was a heavy class. People really, I think it went well. But at the same time, it was so heavy, I broke it up with some uh, uh, like Gopal Bond type stories. And people, if it's done in the proper balance, people will listen better. I gave one class at Krishna House last year. One young uh, boy who had joined the temple, living there a few months. And after the class, he came up to me and he said, I really, really liked your class. And I said, really, what did you get out of it? And he gave me the biggest compliment I have ever heard after anyone's Bhagavatam class. It was a compliment that's so rare, we may never get it in our lifetime. And the compliment was, I didn't fall asleep once. <laughs> oh, God. You're getting better. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we see the really good class givers, they'll talk philosophy, they'll, they'll have some humor, and they'll tell stories. Now, some people, let's take Aradna Swami, for example. He is one of the best storytellers I've ever heard in my life. So he interlaces his class with a lot of stories, some personal, some not, but he's just such a good storyteller that he keeps us focused, and then he can circle back to philosophical points. So Aradna Swami style, sometimes there's things funny and self-deprecating humor. It might be in there. But his main approach is to tell stories and capture us. And he can go give a class for three hours and no one falls asleep. And it's fascinating. Now, other people will give a class for three minutes and my, I, I, I'm sleeping. Once I was at a class in Dallas, I won't mention names, but one leading devotee was giving the class and he has a monotone voice. And um, I, I'm, I'm standing because I'm... Uh, and I'm watching various sannyasis or dundas falling over and then falling over as he speaks in his monotone. And then he said at one point, and Krishna is a supreme personality. And then he paused. And I said, what's going to come next is going to be some incredible wisdom. And finally I realized he had also fallen asleep at his own class. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so if somebody has a sense of humor, introduce that. If somebody's a good storyteller, introduce that. So we have to find every one of us, without any doubt, has the skill to present. And then we can improve it. We have to see what our strengths are and use that to present. And that's a skill that takes some years of cultivation. Uh, I always, after I give a class, find somebody I know and trust and said, tell me something I can do to improve my class. Oh, really? And, you know, first of all, people will say, oh, that was very good. I say, okay, I, but now tell me something I can do to improve it. Because I, I always ask that question because there always is something I can do to improve it. And, uh, you know, sometimes people have said that was too much joking, you know, so I, I have to tone it down. Yeah. And... Um, um, and it depends on my consciousness. Sometimes I really have it together for class. And sometimes I was wondering, was I really there or not at the class I was giving? Oh, at least you, at least you didn't fall asleep. Not yet. <laughs> yeah, that really happened. Uh, that's no exaggeration. So, you know, so uh, yeah, I also have this experience. One time I was doing a recording for a class. And while doing a video recording, the camera for the recording person fell asleep and I continued oh. speaking <laughs> and then I continued speaking and then I fell asleep <laughs> and then somehow before that this the, the, the recording person was a devotee so he had been asking with me about you know which ashram should he join should he become a brahmacharya or should he become a grahastha so I don't know what happened. I nodded off and I woke up and suddenly the first sentence that I spoke is, you should get married. And then he just come, woke up suddenly. <laughs> and then the funniest part, the funniest part was that actually 
he forgot to delete it before uploading the recording <laughs> oh, that's even better <laughs> uh, you know what we call devotees like that in america we call them creamsicles you know what a creamsicle is creamsicle. a creamsicle is a very uh, it's a very popular ice cream it's ice cream covered by orange ice so we say it's orange on the outside and white on the inside so a devotee who's wondering a brahmachari who's wondering if he, if he should get married is usually thinking <laughs> that he ought to be married so we call him creamsicles <laughs> orange on the outside and white on the inside <laughs> creamsicle that's clever i heard something similar about say you know indians in america are called as abcds it's american born confused deshis deshi is a local yeah. word for indian so abcd sure so it is said about them that they are like coconuts they are brown on the outside but white on the inside cuz <laughs> yeah, they don't have cream sickles in india <laughs> no brown yeah, they are coconuts and i, I talked to one uh, one um uh, american uh, devotee son who was brought up his first 20 years in vrindavan hmm. and so i said how do you relate to this and he said i'm white on the outside and brown on the inside <laughs> okay that's interesting <laughs> yeah yeah i can read uh, inside out coconut yeah that's true yeah i i tell you one of the funniest things i do is when i'm with the second generation indian kids you know devotee families for the mo- for the most part and their parents were born in india and they were born in america the thing they have doing that's most fun is imitating their parents because they love american accents so they put on the heavy indian accent and act like their parents and uh, it is and the parents don't mind but it's just when we take absurd situations and we kind of make nice fun of it 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 allows us to look at it with a more with a lighter heart one problem is devotees we we often are too serious about things that we don't need to be serious about uh that's um, can you give an example um sure um we we may get um uh very serious about um um Oh uh, I knew one devotee who uh 1973 he went to India for two months mm. and came back American guy with a heavy Bengali accent. Mm. Cuz he heard of Prabhupad spoke Bengali we should all speak with a Bengali accent even speaking English. So it was kind of like let me hear how grew that eventually but we had this imitation instead instead of following so sometimes uh we can be very in rupa goswami says uh, in the bhakta mri sindhu that we have to distinguish between the details of devotional service and the principles so the principles are uh, uh like it says in the bible love the lord with all thy heart with all thy might mm-hmm. that's the principle that those are the principles of devotional service then there's a detail of what we're particularly wearing and what particular rituals we do and it varies circumstantially for example what we eat um uh, uh what I'm used to eating is very different than what somebody um uh, from malaysia might be used to eating and if i ate with their used to eating it, 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 i have a sensitive stomach it i probably couldn't do very well So those are details of devotional service but some people think oh the details can be more important than the principles so and that r- results in in um a very judgmental society and the one thing people want is us not to judge other people when i met prabhupad one thing that really impressed me is prabhupad didn't judge me oh i barely told him about my weaknesses and he he just started laughing he didn't take it very seriously it wasn't oh you're bad you're bad and and um uh, because the principle was 
that I was trying to learn something about Krishna. And the detail was I wasn't very good at following. So looking at the principles is more important than the details. And successful places have that whole attitude. And unsuccessful yeah. temples have the attitude the details count a lot. They count for something. I mean, the Pujari has to do all the details. I mean, it counts. Uh, and when we find the details count more than the principles, I notice in those places, there is virtually no sense of humor whatsoever. And when there's no sense of humor whatsoever, people are so hung up on details, they're actually missing the, far, the, 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 the forest for the trees. So one of the symptoms, um, one of the symptoms of people who are spiritually advanced is they're lighthearted. Mm. That's not a symptom that I'm making up. It's a symptom from Shastra. They're jolly. They're happy. Prabhupada was, was very, very happy. Even when Prabhupada would get angry at the craziest things people did, it would only last for a moment. Oh, okay. That's true. So, yeah, I witnessed. You know, here about, so, when you talk about not taking, there are some things which are serious, we need to take seriously. But there are some things, if we take it very seriously, then it can itself become a source of uh, absurdity, actually. Yeah, and uh, so sometimes seeing things from that distance perspective, like I read at one time that among, it seems among the Christians in the classic, in the pre-enlightenment time, there was a debate over, you know, something like now how many angels can dance on the top of a pinhead or something like that. And there are books written on that topic. And there are, there are also, there are some traditions where, you know, they had a, in the temple, they had an elephant. And which kind of tilak the elephant should be put on, having that the loyal elephant of the deities should have that. And there was a fight for that. And the two groups went to the Indian Supreme Court. And by oh. the time the case came to the Supreme Court, the elephant had already died. So, <laughs> so I mean, this is it's very much possible in uh, that some small things can be made very big. So we could, so what you're saying is that Pointing out the absurdity of making small things big is also a way of bringing humor. Hmm? I think I remember yeah. you, you would like to tell that humor about Protestants and uh, you know that there was that nun. You told me that. You know? yeah, well, yeah, there was a nun, um, a nunnery in um, Ireland and the young Matilda, 10-year-old Matilda, the mother superior said, Matilda, what would you like to be when you grow up? And she goes, a prostitute. And she goes, Jesus, Mary, Joseph, oh my God, what did you say? And she goes, I want sister to be a prostitute when I grow up. She said, oh, thank God. I thought you had said Protestant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Mm. Yeah, I've, I've, now that's one. I told that in Bhagavatam class because it, it does talk. It, 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 when, I'm, when the verse relates to something about religious fanaticism, that kind of brings up that point. Hmm. So just, Piori will have more insight on this, I'm sure. Piori, what do you, what do you think about this? What about this? Ah, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, um, about uh, being too serious. Oh yeah, and the danger yeah. of that. Yeah, I, I have actually. I, I got something from a old Back to Godhead magazine. It's uh, I guess from March of '92, when the new Back to Godhead I guess came out, and someone you know that they, they have things people write in and they write down what the person that said, and then they give an answer. And he says, "I enjoyed your Back to Godhead." But I believe it's it's greatly lacking in one area, humor, and and he just gets into this a little bit. He's a, a devotee, I guess, from Akron, not initiated, but Akron, Ohio. But one of us present it seriously. Still, I think you are right that we can sometimes afford to be a little humorous, 
and he talks about Bhagavad Gita, the devotee is, uh, is joyful, is jolly, is jolly. So that joyful attitude should reflect in, in back to Godhead. And sometimes we may have some um, amusing anecdotes. We will try to keep an eye out for ways to introduce humor in BTG while still keeping our overall sober tone. So it's, it, you know, even people are noticing there's no humor in it. It's not normal. It's like, it has to be human. It's human in everything. I mean, you even see these presidents, presidential debates and stuff. They, 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 they hate each other, but they put in some humor, you know? <laughs> you know, it, it, makes it, it makes it a little more interesting. Without humor, it's boring. You know, most things are. You have to have some humor. Yeah. But there's a danger of being too serious. And the danger is we'll take ourselves too seriously. And if we take ourselves too seriously, we become self-righteous. And if you want to be bored, stay with self-righteous people. For example, um, uh, um, we have a certain president in America who's about, when he speaks, about as boring as anyone can get. Because he's very self-righteous, very very narcissistic, and very, very boring. Yeah, I think, so, you know, this is the opposite of what you said, that if it's self-deprecating, it becomes humorous. If it's self-congratulatory, then it, 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 it is not at all humorous. It becomes unappealing. Mm. Very so, much so. Yeah. So now as devotees, you know, when they're self-deprecating, uh, Self-deprecating humor is, I feel, much safer than criticizing particular groups of people or like that. So are there any examples of how self-deprecating humor could be done? I'll give a, there was a recent example in America I like. There's a Senator Duckworth who was uh, a pilot in Iraq and um, she lost her legs when a shell hit her helicopter. So she's in a wheelchair and she's a senator and a very patriotic, uh, good person. And she was recently criticized by our president because she was oppositional to him as being non-patriotic. So how did she respond? It was brilliant. She said, I would like him, I would like our president to walk a mile in my shoes. Because she has no shoes, she has no legs. <laughs> okay. Now that is good humor. Hmm, that's so true. That, that, that was very, very sharp. Um, there's a danger, you know, danger of being too serious and danger of not being serious enough. It's very easy, easy to be frivolous. Um, when Prabhupada walked by a famous story, an ashram in Denver, and he heard devotees gossiping about one sannyasi who was having some trouble, Prabhupada was very, very upset because he didn't want gossip. So they were laughing at this person's expense in a gossip way. So that's very, very dangerous humor. That's not even funny. So that's a dangerous kind of humor. And we have, it's very easy to be frivolous in Grumya Kata. At the same time, it's very easy to be uh, artificially serious. Now, we never have to worry about that with Piari, so we're safe here. <laughs> Okay, so um, well, I was in the beginning. Yeah, yeah, but, but you get over it after a while. Yeah, it's enough of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and a lot. Like for example, I was asked to give a class recently to the twenty-five to forty-year-old youth, and they wanted me to speak about the four regular principles. So I said, "Okay, I'll give a title that will get some good attendance." So. I'm, my title was Four Regular Principles. No meat, fish, or eggs, and what the hell is the other one? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone came. And we had a good philosophical talk. Oh, God, okay. So. <laughs> That's good. So basically, now, you know, there are two. Uh, I would like to go back to earlier to the point which you mentioned. That uh, yeah, that you know everybody has different talents. Like 
some devotees can speak uh, katha very nicely so we all have to find our talents so how much should as devotees we try to develop humor now especially when i spend time with pyari prabhu he brings out the hasya ras within me but as soon as i get separated from him i lose it and then once i tried to do it consciously and he told me that you know you know, don't try to do it consciously because it doesn't work just focus on your strengths so you know when does it so one day is that it distracts the audience from the message that is one danger which we should discuss we need a balance but the other is it may distract the speaker itself the speaker might uh, become you could say uh, not natural to oneself or not authentic because of trying to develop humor so how much should one try for that or one shouldn't try at all or what are your thoughts on this what well, is a big danger that if you try too hard you could end up jewish next life uh, <laughs> oh god well let pr answer well i i don't think you should try it's like you i mean i mean i i don't i kind of just see what's natural you know i just don't think it should be artificial and like uh, brahmatiya said you know the timing has to be exactly right you know and then it's funny so if you're not really good with the timing it's not going to come out funny uh, so i i don't i mean it's it's uh, everybody's different everyone has different abilities you know krishna says i'm the ability in man so if you have the ability or you're humorous and you can use it in krishna service if you're if you're not so humorous but you can appreciate humor then that's that's also good if you're not so humorous and you can't appreciate humor <laughs> I, i don't know where you where you where you stand in life you're kind of like a robot but at least appreciate it uh anyway i don't i don't see how i uh trying to I mean to be a little conscious of it maybe I can do something to implement it you know to try to be funny but it seems artificial to me you know to to be make a conscious effort of how to be funny it's to me it's almost like it's there or it's not and you just accept it I got other abilities you know I can uh this you know spiritual scientist you can use that it's I'm sure that's more pleasing then saying a jewish joke <laughs> so are there uh, yeah, so, so you know uh, i know you're different yeah ramathir the pro thank you but we have abilities and then if you got it use it yeah it's true i think priori put it perfect i mean he 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 said it perfectly well and and that's why i emphasize we get feedback what can i do to improve my classes now if somebody says well i uh, in order to improve your classes i want you to quote a lot more shastra they're not going to get that you know quote a bunch of sanskrit verses well after three i start running out of material so um uh you know that's not me that's someone else and and so we 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 um uh there's a song i played for some devotees in vrindavan these are indian devotees who know nothing about the west and it might be an odd song but i was giving a series of classes on on uh, how to um on the loneliness of being a devotee that it, it was a serious issue in 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 that part of india where i was and uh it it it's and the song i played was one of my parents favorite songs uh and and the song uh you 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 will know this pra sammy davis junior he he was a very unusual personality he was african american had one eye and was black and jewish jewish yeah he's very very unusual personality uh with this great voice and he sang a song i got to be me now we think as devotees this is very counterintuitive to our own uh ego no we just want to be a servant but i played this for a few devotees who knew nothing about anything western and i had it on my iphone and i said yeah that's the problem because this is what krishna is saying in the gita he's telling arjuna b 
beating him up. You're not this body. You're not this. You're a fool, blah, blah, blah. Then he spends the whole rest of the Gita trying to reconnect him to this body as a warrior to use in service of Krishna. So we can very easily make the pendulum swing too far and we're not this body. And we can very easily make the pendulum swing too far um, that I have to be an individual. And how to how to balance this properly so we have our own individual nature to use in Krishna service. Um, Borijan Prabhu puts it brilliantly. He says, in management in ISKCON, we have a reversal that doesn't work very well. And a reversal is this. Management should be saying, what is your propensity? What is it your propensity? And devotees should be saying, I'll do anything for Krishna. Instead, we have devotees crying out, the ordinary devotee, I want to do my propensity. And managers saying, no, you do any, anything for Krishna that's needed. So we kind of reverse these things of how it should be. So it's a matter of developing our own propensity, our own style. And, and that, that takes us back to humor. And that wasn't very funny what I just said. So you can erase this part. I, I have to, I'd like to say something that can probably be erased also. But uh, when I was a kid, uh, there was a joke. Let's... <laughs> oh, God. Okay, so I, 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 you'll probably erase this, but Piari and I both, our father's favorite joke was the same. And we just discovered this. So I'll tell you the joke, but you'll probably have to erase it. But it has a good humor to it. It has some nice humor. It's a place it fits in. So there was this teenage boy who had a wooden eye. And, and he was very sensitive about it. In those days, when you're, you lost an eyeball, they replaced it with a wooden eyeball. But no one could tell. You couldn't tell looking at it. It was really perfect. But he was still sensitive. So he's at a dance, and he's afraid to ask anybody to dance. And he sees this real <laughs> girl in the corner who no one will ask to dance. So he says, oh, maybe she'll dance with me. So he walks up to her and he says to her, would you dance with me? And she goes, would I, would I? And he goes. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> so uh, that's another kind of humor where we do a play on words. And play on words is very popular humor. Now, in that regard, um, I've talked to Rida Nanamraj about this, who's you know, uh, expert in Sanskrit. And he points out to me in the Bhagavatam, just like that joke I told you, there are, I, I can't give you an example off the top of my head, but there are many examples of the sages in the Bhagavatam using humor that doesn't work in English, but works in Sanskrit, just like that would I joke, where they take a word with a double entendre and, and he points out to me in the verses, and it's hilarious when, when you know it. I mean, these sages were having a good time when they're speaking, and they were putting jokes and puns right in these serious Sanskrit verses. And he points it out, and when he explains what the Sanskrit meetings are, it's hilarious. But we're not going to pick up on it because we don't know Sanskrit. It's a different language. So even these sages in the Bhagavatam, they were not nearly as serious as we think they are. They had a good sense of humor. That's fascinating. Are there any examples of how the Sanskrit was humorous or it's too technical? To... Yeah. There, there is He's a pointed... devotion about, uh, I forget the Sanskrit word, but it says that where did you, Radharani is, you know, is asking Krishna, where did you spend your night? And he, he separated the words differently. And it says, the night has kidnapped you. And he said, how can I be kidnapped by night? And then before that, in the same, in the same section of his qualities of Krishna, uh, it also gives another example of Radha and Krishna. And she'd say something, and Prabhupada would say the Sanskrit, but if you divide it, the same exact words, but if you divide it differently, it has a different meaning. So uh, that, that's definitely in the Nectar Devotion. I could find it. Oh, yeah, I remember quick. that. That's, yeah, that's, that's a beautiful play of words. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And, and generally, well, uh, these go over our head. We miss these because we don't know Sanskrit very well. You really have to know Sanskrit well 
to get the double entendres. Actually, at the end of that, it, the Prabhupada says, and in this way, Krishna gladdened the, the, the gladdened Radharani, but said gladdened the most, Glad in the favorite of the devotees or of the of the gopis, he, he this way he gladdened her. So by taking these words and changing them around, he made her happy. You know, he, he didn't answer her questions. She asked two two questions or three questions, and uh, he just changed them all around and it gladdened her. So Krishna's you know expert, he's doing it. So why can't we? <laughs> of course, we can't do everything Krishna does, but in this case, it's it's nice. Uh, humorous. Krishna was definitely humorous, so many times. And play of words is a very common humor in the Bhagavatam, and yeah. um, and and we find in in the writings of the Goswamis, we'll see in the intimate pastimes a, a lot of plays of words, like the Wood Eye one. Which works in English, but not in Sanskrit. So, assumably, these work in Sanskrit, but not in English. Yeah. You know, I thought that uh, it's still, it's like a, you know, to, to some extent, I am good at words, and I, li I can play at words to bring about some memorable message. But it's one thing to phrase something in a memorable way, it's another to phrase something in a humorous way. And it seems that even with word play, it can be done in different ways. And the ability to word of word play is not the same as ability of humor. They're two different things, but they overlap at some places. You're the master of pithy phrases. And one of the reasons myself and others like your classes so much, you come up with these easy to remember short phrases that are extremely effective. That's your talent. And um, if that's your talent, that's what you run with. I'm not so good at that. I'm not going to come up with pithy phrases that people remember, but I keep, you have a book you publish of pithy phrases and I, I, I keep it on my reading stack and sometimes look at it and try to, okay, I'll remember this one. This is a good one to use because that, that is your talent. You're, you're excellent at words. It's, it's, it's not that you, you you have to artificially add humor, but you know, it comes up naturally. Um, uh, uh, you can do it. Yeah. True. You, you, you said you can't do, you don't do that, but you did it with the uh, four regulated principles, no meat, fish and eggs. And what was the other, third or fourth one? What was the other one? Yeah. 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 What the hell's the other one? Yeah. You got oh, inspired okay. by him. <laughs> that is superb. Yeah, and, and people, and then it was a very serious discussion about them, a very serious, appropriate discussion. But, you know, it got people's attention to come. Uh, it's just like in the early days when they had the, um, uh, in Haight-Ashbury, their first big event, they called How to Stay High Forever. Because everyone was on drugs, it was a play on words, high on the mantra. So yeah. um, the main thing is to uh, um, get people to be a little interested. It's not by logic and reason that people become devotees. It's by the higher taste. And then they look back and they see all of this is logical and reasonable. Yeah. So, you know, we have to attract people to, uh, to, to, to try it out. That's the secret. That's true. So ultimately, you know, we need to get people interested in Krishna's message and whatever works for us, each of us will do that. Mm. Yes. So just one or two last questions and then we could conclude if you have any concluding words. So are there, say, some examples of humor that we would say is an absolute no-no? Like you gave an example of... <coughs> making fun of some devotee who is going through some personal crisis. Yeah. Oh, 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 wait, wait. A... I... Oh, hold it a second. You just coughed. It's, it's... Oh, okay, I'm wiping off my screen. Okay, <laughs> go back. Okay. It's COVID time. <laughs> That's true. Okay. And it's not a conspiracy theory to think that COVID can go through the internet also. 
Uh, I've seen that theory. They really say that? Uh, well, um, uh, uh, there are, uh, yes, they say all kinds of crazy things. Uh, uh, just as an aside, we're beginning a, a, a newsletter now for the Bhaktivedanta Institute. And I think the column that may end up being the most popular is going to be called Ask the Nerd. <laughs> <laughs> And we're going to entertain questions like that. Is it going to be ASK or ASS? Uh, ah, uh, ASK. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Ask the nerd. I like that. That's, that's good play of words. Yeah. So, okay. So are there some kinds of humor which you would say are, are unacceptable, which should be avoided at all costs? So one example you gave is uh, of, as I said, making jokes of making fun of devotees who have facing problems. Like recently it happened that there was one devotee, very good speaker, but he made some caricatures of certain classes of people. Say there was tension between India and China. And then he made some caricature of some Chinese people and some other people. And uh, it, it really, came off as he, he had a good heart. He, just want, he didn't want, and he has used good classes also, but it came off as quite, uh, uh, quite inflammatory for some people and it just uh, backfired. So sometimes things can just go too far. Do you have any boundaries that uh, we need to keep in mind? Any thoughts on this? Yari, what do you think? Well, I think it's something it's like something you can, you can, if it's not like something's very serious, somebody has some big problem and you're making fun of it, that's certainly wrong. But when it's like, I don't know, it seems like when you exaggerate it so much, it becomes funny when you make it like, uh, if you have a little problem and you just exaggerate it, then it can be funny. It depends on what it is. But I think you got to be careful and not, you know, or you have to, you have to know your audience and you have to not say anything that's going to really offend anyone. Um, yeah, that is one danger that there's much comedy that is getting canceled now because of political correctness. And yeah, yeah so yes, Ramadita Prabhu, anything? Um, if the humor is hurtful and puts people deeper in the bodily concept of life, it's not very helpful. So, um, uh, so if, I mean, there are wonderful Chinese devotees and of all, like take, take, take our president in America. He always refers to the coronavirus as a Chinese virus for political purposes because it began there. But what good is that the rest of the world doesn't call it that, but he makes a political point. And uh, we've seen uh, Chinamen by, uh, attacked in America just for being Chinese. And they lived here their whole life. They were born here. So that kind of, that's not funny what he's doing. It's nasty. And uh, if we're going to uh, be hurtful, that doesn't help. So that's why humor is often self-deprecating, not deprecating others. Now, sometimes we'll, we'll, you know, Prabhupada gave the example when uh, he was being challenged by a woman reporter, why do you shave your head? And he goes, why do you shave your legs? That's fair. It's funny, but it's a fair question. Uh, and it's not horribly insulting. But um, uh, to insult, uh, and we have to also speak according to the time, place, and circumstance. So if we're in... Nowadays, people are more sensitive to what's being saying. And there were th jokes Prabhupada said about certain minorities, especially in the early Bhagavatam. He would make these comments that at the time were not hurtful and even comedians of that ethnicity would talk, would say the same thing. But then times have changed, circumstances have changed, and now it doesn't work anymore. And when Prabhupada was pointed out um, early on that some of his comments don't work anymore, Prabhupada told his editor, oh, fix that. 
because they can be humor changes over times. So as devotees, our business isn't um, to be humorous for the sake of humorous or to, or to be controversial for the sake of controversy. Our, our uh, business is, is to be ladies and gentlemen. So to be ladies and gentlemen, we have to be very sensitive to our audience. And our audience is not just what I want them to be. It's who they are. So we have to be very careful. Uh, when I speak, uh, it, you know, due to COVID, it's a weird thing. But nowadays I hear and give more classes I ever did in my life. And it's the silver lining of, of COVID. There's so much more hearing and speaking. Um, so a lot of my audiences are overseas. So I have to be, uh, first, it's very hard for me to introduce humor because it's being translated. Yeah. Yeah, I just gave one in Russia and one in Latin America. So very difficult to introduce humor that way. So I don't even try. Second, they have different um, political systems and some things that we may find very funny and easy to talk about in America would be very hard to talk about there. So I'm very sensitive to the audience I'm speaking to. And if in doubt, leave it out. That's good. I, I remember in, in Ukraine, I gave a class and I said something really funny. I don't remember what it was, but it was really funny. And they translated it, and not one person laughed. <laughs> oh. Yeah, no, that's all the time it happens to me. And it, uh, well, I, but I take it back. One person did laugh. Unfortunately, it was only me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's interesting. Yeah. So I, I appreciate this point that you know if it is if it is hurtful and if it reinforces people's bodily concept of life, then it's yeah. completely unhelpful. So a good good criteria. Yeah. Now hurtful also is very subjective. That's why it becomes a problem. Like you said, in different cultures or at different times, what would be considered hurtful that will have to be seen according to time, place, circumstance. So when you said Prabhupada said adjust those things means Prabhupada told them to remove them from his books or what did he actually, what did that just mean? He did. He did. There's certain things in the early Bhagavatam that was printed in India, we'll find certain statements are not found in the Bhagavatam that, that was first printed in America. Because Hari Griva pointed out that some of these statements would be not acceptable in America now. It, it, it was a different context. Oh. And and so and then Prabhupada was making the point that what's important is that um, I don't have the exact quote in front of me, but that um, uh, what be said have its impact. And he wanted to deliver Krishna, not some political statement. So certain things he said, even in some joking way, that it would not be understood in that context. So he had it changed. Now I'm not advocating on what we do with after Prabhupada passed on with book changes. That's a whole different subject. I'm talking about what Prabhupada did when he was on the planet and how he dealt with these things. Prabhupada, uh, I've talked to his editors in great depth and Prabhupada, when Prabhupada was here, wanted his editors, things that would be offensive in a particular culture that were not essential to the Siddhanta. He had no trouble with his editors adjusting it. None whatsoever. Now, after he passes on, how do we deal with it? That's a complex issue. And uh, that issue doesn't uh, lend itself very good to a discussion on humor. Yeah, uh, it's not very funny. No, no. I, I, you know, I, if the people discussing it had a little more sense of humor, we'd easily solve the problem. And, and, and you know, we need, one time when uh, there was a focus group in London and they were looking, it was a panel of non devotees looking at all of our books and saying, what was their first impression? It was very smart of the BBT in Europe to find out how do people like our books? And they picked a good cross-sectional panel. So when they came across perfect questions, perfect answers, they said the title is presumptuous. And of course, Prabhupada gave the title. I never thought of it that way, but I realized it could be. So I went to the BBTs doing a new edition. So I said to the BBT, well, why don't we change the title with the subtitle? Because 
it can be presumptuous. This is what the focus group you paid said. I said, why don't we call it this? Perfect questions, perfect answers. A funny thing happened to me on the way to the Ganges. It would take the edge out of it. Oh. And of course, the perfect questions took place, you know, practically on the bank of the Ganges then, you know, in Mayapur. So, uh, of course, they didn't have much sense of humor. And they said, no, we can never do that. Okay. So then I said, okay, I'll get my revenge. So I wrote a new introduction and I called the introduction a perfectly presumptuous title. <laughs> and then I described okay. why Prabhupada, because I just dealt with it head on. And I dealt, said why Prabhupada chose that name and why it was shastrically appropriate, even though it sounds presumptuous. So we have to deal with these things. We have to you know, my feeling is we have to be careful of how we present. Bhakti Siddhanta made an interesting comment on this. He said the disciple should make sure the guru is dressed nicely. Sorry, come again. There's a. He, he, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati said the disciple should make sure the guru is dressed nicely. Should make sure he makes a good presentation. Okay. Uh, dress his clothing is very. Okay. Well attired. For, for, for example, if you were with Prabhupada or you were with some Radna Swami or some spiritual mentor and they had a piece of spinach in their teeth right before they were speaking, would you say something to them or not? According to Bhakti Siddhanta, you should say something. Oh, there's some spinach caught in your tooth. Very embarrassing to speak. Have you ever spoken with spinach in your teeth? That's horribly embarrassing. When you're done, you see there's a piece of spinach that you missed. So you're speaking from practical experience? <laughs> Extremely. Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, these, these, things, these, things do, uh, these things do happen. I, I, I mean, it, it, you know, when I walk in the room and my zipper is open, I pray that somebody will tell me that I don't have to spend the whole lecture standing in front of there like that. It's very embarrassing. And there's no man around that wore a pair of pants that hasn't had that happen to him. This is a... yeah, so, you, you, so we want, so we want to, uh, we don't want to change, ever change messages, but we want to put our best foot forward. Hmm. That's it's delicate. And, and this requires, I'm sure you have a pithy statement on this, but it, it, it requires uh, a nuanced intelligence. Yeah. I, I don't know what is a pithy statement on this, but yeah, I think that sometimes uh, what we I think it's a well-known statement that outreach means to know when to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comforted. When to comfort yes. the afflicted and afflict the comforted. Yeah, so that's true. So one last question, Prabhu, uh, with which uh, what would both of you like to give maybe one example of what you what comes at the top of your mind as one of the best humors that you have spoken or you thought of, or you have heard, or you have shared recently? Um, boy, it, it all happens so spontaneous. It's hard to think of it. Piari, do you have something while I'm thinking? Yes, while you're thinking, I'll say something. Uh, let me know when you finish thinking. Of, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know? I thought of a Uber. I thought you would say this stuff. You are thinking so loudly that I can't speak. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even. You're thinking so loudly. I can't think. <laughs> no, I can't speak. <laughs> uh, anyway, I, I, I mean, the, 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 probably one of the funniest ones is what I already said in, in Dallas with uh, ladies first. But uh, I was going with Naranjana Swami. It was in the summer. It was a hot day. And we're going to do a home program. But the home program was not at somebody's house. It was just an apartment building, a lot of our apartments. So when you go in in the front door, there's some, some teenagers 
uh, who were just sitting around there and we walking in dressed in, uh, you know, uh, kurtas and dhotis. And uh, one of the guys said, how come you're wearing sheets? And I turned and said, because it's too hot for a blanket. <laughs> oh, God, that's good. And the Rajan Swami said, did you just think of that? I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I remember when we were there together at one devotee's house in Connecticut, we, we had lunch together. Yeah. And then the day asked you, no, so, uh, or you hope the lunch was good. You said, yes, it was wonderful. So what did you like? So you said, I liked the speaking and I didn't like the hearing. <laughs> Thank you. For I'm, very, I'm very humble. <laughs> Like lots of times when people tell me, oh, you're so wonderful, you're so great, you're this and that, and I just generally acknowledge yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's one thing funny, there's one devotee, I've observed this one devotee, the appreciation of devotee, oh, you are so kind. And this devotee says, I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> They tell me something. Tell me something I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's even more humorous. <laughs> yes, Brahmadirtha Bru. I'm just well. These things come so spontaneously um, uh, that uh, uh, trying to think of something I recently said it just doesn't it it doesn't uh, come to mind immediately. Not necessarily recent. Uh, a long time ago, also would do. Oh, okay. Uh, well, let me think oh, for we a know you, We know your recent memories aren't so as good as your long-term memory. And exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and, and it's just, um, well, let me see. Um, well, we'll, we'll, we'll go back. Um, I was giving a class to, uh, again, it was, uh, oh, I know what it was. I was uh, recently doing a mediation with with a bunch of uh, um, at a temple in America where uh, the uh, Indian community was fighting among themselves, especially these two people were in an argument. So I was asked to mediate it. So we get on video and uh, and everyone's really serious. So I, I, I understand I have to do something. So I, I kept calling this one guy by the wrong name and he corrected me twice. And I said, gosh, I'm sorry about that, but all you Indians look alike. Do all us Americans look alike to you? And, and immediately broke the ice. <laughs> you know, this is very striking. I was reading a book by one Christian author about the existence yeah. of God. And he's yeah. right that you know, everything in this world is individual and different. So he says, every, every particle of sand is different. Even if it looks, even if two particles look identical, they're different. You know, every, every, um, he goes two, three lists he use. No, every leaf is different. And then the last thing he said, you know, every Hare Krishna monk is different. <laughs> Perfect. The same point. It is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, simultaneously, one and different. One oh, and different. Yes, yeah, true. Mm. Yeah. So, Bruce, thank you. And, 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 yeah, go ahead. Okay. And, and thank you. Thank you very much. It's always fun speaking with you, Chaitanya Charan. No, I didn't want to interrupt oh, you. You were saying something? Please. No, that well, I, I the only thing I I, I was saying is it, 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 it's it, it's it's a real it's a real balance uh, uh, on humor, um, uh, and it has to come naturally and flow, and um, um, if the, you know the message was was you asked how can devotees use more humor? Well, watch people who use it well and learn from them. But if it becomes artificial, it can become dangerous. 
Yeah, that's true. Uh, I'd like to say also about hurtful. It seems like, because I, I, I say a lot of things about different people, you know, to them, but they're my friends and we have a relationship like that. It seems like with friends, you can do that more than if you don't know the people, you don't start saying something negative about them. It's only people that you know well that you can do that. That's what I find. With, with my Like I, I just did a few things with Brahmatirta tonight, but he's my friend. I don't know if he's going to still be my friend after. No, but this is what makes us friends because we trust each other enough that we can joke with each other. As Prabhupada, I mean, you know, when Prabhupada was with his god brothers, sometimes they were laughing hysterically, of course, not knowing the language or speaking either Bengali or Hindi. I couldn't follow it, but my gosh, they were hysterical. And they were telling the same kind of things that we might, we might laugh about. Uh, there is this, um, yeah, we don't want to be dry. We don't want to be dry either. You know, overly dry uh, means we're, we're too uptight. Yeah, that's true. You know, when, one thing we said about, you mentioned earlier about there's a danger of becoming, I thought you will say there's the danger of becoming too frivolous. But then you made the point that there's a danger of being too serious also. So I think balance is the key. Yeah. So maybe I'll try, to, I'll try to summarize what we discussed. And then if you want to have, both of you want to add some well, uh, words, we'll try to do I'll add just one point to that. We need to learn to be better Buddhists. Better Buddhists. Why is that? Yes. Well, the Buddhists are always expert at the middle way. Oh, okay. Good. <laughs> the middle way. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. So yeah, we try to discuss today on humor in humor in Krishna consciousness. So I think you mentioned that you know, there is it's at one level it's a nat- it's a it's a natural talent. It can grow by nurture a little bit, but it is natural. And then there was initially like just for me, for all of us, maybe initially there was a little conflict between Krishna consciousness and humor. Can we be Krishna humor? in Krishna consciousness, but eventually Prabhu, you gave several examples of Prabhupada's humor also. And um, so we try to dis- categorize different kinds of humors. So humor that strengthens the message we are given, humor that softens the message and maybe softens by not getting into technicalities of difficult questions. Several examples of that kind of humor we had with Prabhupada. And then there could be humor that distracts from the message. So the key point is that we need to get people interested. And if we can, if it's too serious, the class people will not be interested. But then if we start pursuing humor itself as an end, then that is, that is, that is, that will backfire because we're not sharing a message at all. So each of us can find out what is our particular strength and then use that to communicate in an interesting way. And as far as developing humor, we can learn, observe how other devotees do it and learn to some extent. But that shouldn't become too much of an obsession. And regarding uh, boundaries for humor, especially if it's hurtful, if it reinforces people's bodily conceptions, then that is unhelpful. And even humor that might be seem hurtful in one context might not be when there is this friendship and trust. So in general, Self-deprecating humor would be the best because we are not going to hurt anyone by that. And <clears throat> sarcasm, especially if somebody is facing personal pro- problems in their life, the personal moral problems or something like that, to make fun of that is 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 Prabhupada. I was very unhappy with that. <clears throat> and uh, it also talked about the, how there is the balance between taking ourselves too seriously which also means taking small, small details too seriously, which can lead us to become fanatical. And then the other extreme would be that not taking even serious things seriously. So maybe actually that instead of saying that we follow the Buddhist way, maybe the Buddhists adopted the middle way from the balanced idea of the Sanatan Dharma. And that's how the name came up. But following that middle way would be helpful. So thank you very much for any concluding words both of you would like to share. Pyari Prabhu. Uh, well, there's so many things I could say, but, but about the middle way, I mean, this is what Krishna says, don't eat too much, eat too little, don't sleep too much, you know, not, uh, 
or sleep too little. Uh, so we, we have to use that. I was just thinking of something. When I was in the Navy, there was this one guy, he was pretty puffed up. Anyway, we're in the office and there's a bunch of, you know, sailors there. And, and I was talking to him, me and him were having a conversation. And he's saying, you know, I joined this Navy you know, to help out this Navy and this and, you know, this and that. He was just saying some stuff like that. And I said, if I wanted to help the Navy, I would have joined the Army. So when I said that, uh, the other people, everybody appreciated that more than this guy who was saying how he's helping the Navy so much. I said, if I wanted to help the Navy, I would have joined the Army. So it's kind of putting myself down. And people like that. They, they, I had friends. He didn't have any friends, you know. So it's it's not too good to think so highly of yourself. You got to mm. be humble. But anyway, I can't. There's just so much. You can erase whatever you like, and I'm fine with it. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it. it's at least fine. So you this this point about that sometimes now I've been a very poor book distributor whenever I go out because I just can't talk with people for one or two minutes. I have to get into deeper discussions. So I told once the best way I can do do book distribution is by not doing book distribution <laughs> by doing some <laughs> other service. <laughs> Right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Brahmati, yeah. any last words? Uh, humor can be used to make good points about the frailties of human nature. I mean, Krishna spent a lot of time pointing out to Arjuna certain frailties of nature. So we'll end with a joke. Please. <laughs> and being from a Jewish family, I have to do a Jewish joke. Okay. So a, a Jewish mother gives her son two ties on his birthday. And he's so happy to, happy to get the two ties. And the following morning, he comes down to breakfast wearing one of the ties. And his mother said to him, so you don't like the other one? Anyway. <laughs> it's really a Jewish joke. I don't know. Very Jewish. <laughs> because where that comes from is Jewish mothers tend to be overbearing. It comes down with one tie and she says, what? You didn't like the other one? <laughs> so, um, it, 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 or, or here, we'll give a different version. This old Jewish lady sitting on a bench and she's complaining, oh boy, am I thirsty. I am so thirsty. Boy, am I thirsty. I am so thirsty. Somebody hears her and brings her a glass of water. And as he's walking away, he hears her saying, Oh boy, was I thirsty? <laughs> oh God, that's... Oh, we, we, we kind of make fun of the human experience. Yeah, I... and 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 that's healthy. That kind of humor can be can be very healthy in helping us, you know, get sort of past our our, our own ego. That's true. So I have one yeah. question. Um, among the two of you, who is the senior in the Monks podcast? Whose name should I put first? Uh, PRAs. Senior in, in what? <laughs> Who's older? I don't know how old you are. No, a, a PRE uh, got initiated before me. Okay. Yeah. He's the longest serving temple president in North America. No, he's definitely, he, he, he's, he's definitely senior, even if I show him no respect. <laughs> Maybe because he's senior, you don't show him any respect. <laughs> yeah, no, we, we just show him respect with the mind. <laughs> oh, God. Thank you very much. It was wonderful talking with you. And thank you for sharing your humor. Hey, thanks. Your experiences. Hare Krishna. Yeah.